to the high voltage seminar. This is achieving high power density and ultra low standby power and flyback converter session. This is being presented by Michael Laughlin. My name is John Cummings. I'll be the moderator for the session. All participants are going to be muted for the session. Please use the chat function to ask questions and address it to everyone. We will be answering questions throughout the webinar in chat. Also in chat, if you're having any problems hearing or seeing the presentation, please let us know. With that, I will hand it off to Mike to get it started. Hello, my name is Michael O'Loughlin, and today I'm going to talk to you about achieving high power density and ultra low standby power and flyback designs. I had a little bit of my background. I've been working on AC DC power factor correction, um, phase shifted full bridge from one watt to multi kilowatts AC to DC step down converters. So that's a little bit about me. Let's go on and start talking about the presentation. So here's the agenda. We're basically going to re review the primary side regulated flyback control, the benefits of doing that. It also comes with some associated issues that we're going to discuss and how to overcome those. Then we're going to talk about the new wake up monitoring chip, the UCC24650. And that's used with primary side regulated flyback controllers, such as the 28730 to actually speed up transient response and reduce the output capacitor bank by a factor of seven. The other benefit of this combination of chips and primary side regulated flyback controls is that it uses this control scheme that we're gonna discuss in depth. That uses FM, AM, FM modulation. And by doing that at no load conditions, you can dissipate less than five milliwatts. This is what's known in the industry as zero power. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the device feature set of the 28730 and the UCC 24650, the protection features, the benefits, the things that it will actually bring to your design. And finally, I'm gonna go through some design tips and tricks, how to design with these two ICs, not just why you should use them. And finally, we're gonna take questions. So let's talk a little bit about primary side regulated flybacks. What, what does this actually mean? Well, let's talk about the basic flyback. In a traditional flyback, you use an opto feedback to send information about the output voltage back to the controller to regulate your duty cycle and control your output voltage. What primary side regulation means is I can get that information from the primary to aux turns ratio during the freewheeling or the energy delivering period of the flyback, okay? So this is where I deliver the energy, okay? So while I'm delivering energy, I can actually get samples about what the output is doing and control my duty cycle based on the output voltage that I'm sensing from the aux winding. So I do not need this optocoupler. Well, that saves me a lot of money, okay? Because the optocoupler and all the components around it Okay, probably 20, 25 cents for the whole design. So you make your design cheaper. What else does this do for me? When I have this circuitry sitting there, it will dissipate five to 10 milliwatts. And if I'm trying to achieve a standby power, <clears throat> excuse me, of five milliwatts, it will be impossible. So getting rid of the opto is a bonus. So let's talk a little bit about how this actually works. Oh, wait, did I skip a slide? Hold on. No, I'm okay. So let's talk about how this actually works. The FMAM modulation scheme, okay? So we'll start off at the beginning. We have our simple flyback controller here. We have a rectifier diode. This is basically a TVS clamp, okay? We have a FET to drive the circuit, okay? We have a current sense resistor, all the basics. And remember I said to see what the output voltage is doing, you actually look at the aux to secondary turns ratio. So I basically I start the converter, the device has no information. I turn on the FET, okay, and the current is controlled to a peak current of I peak, okay, during T on. Okay, here I have no information, so it's gonna go to maximum duty cycle. Then the switch is gonna turn off when the peak current's achieved. And then the aux winding, okay, it's gonna go positive. Here it was negative, okay, it will go positive. And during this time, 
okay, we can actually determine what the output voltage is. And V out, okay, is equal to, okay, on the primary side, right? This is, excuse me, I'm doing this backwards. Basically, V out is gonna be the output voltage. Okay, so V out is going to equal to, okay, V out, divided by N secondary, okay, times N aux. It's very straightforward. And with this information, we can actually control the duty cycle and control the output voltage. And everyone should recognize this as the DC transfer function, okay, of a flyback. Okay, excuse me, the duty cycle. So we talked about the benefits okay, of primary side regulation, okay? But we haven't talked about what actually is negative about this. Now, I, I haven't gotten into depth about this yet, but this uses an AM-FM modulation scheme, okay? Well, while it's operating in FM, okay, it will start at a maximum frequency of 80 kilohertz, okay, with a constant on time, and to control the duty cycle, it will go down to a minimum switching frequency of one kilohertz. So what happens when this is going on, okay, is if I have a fast signal transient, it's gonna take one millisecond for the IC to make any decision. And to overcome that, you have to size your output capacitor based on your maximum transient current, okay, and your minimum switching frequency of one kilohertz. One kilohertz, so this capacitor gets quite big. So to improve the low transient response of these primary side regulated flyback controllers, a TI, we've developed this UCC24650 that attaches to your output and works with the UCC28730 flyback controller. And what it does is it actually allows you to size a capacitor for a much faster transient response, okay? And it also allows you to hit a sub five milliwatts, because we have a faster transient response, we can operate down to a minimum switching frequency of 32 kilohertz versus one kilohertz. Now, the way this works is the UCC 24650 will monitor the output. If it drops below 3%, and we'll get into this in more detail, it will send signals across the transformer that will tell the 28730 that the voltage is low and to respond. And that's, it. that's how it works. We'll get into a little more detail of what that covers. So let's talk about the 24650 in a little more depth. We're monitoring the output, we're switching, Okay, we're at light loads. This is my aux voltage, you know, my aux winding. It's a representation of the output. I'm at no load, okay? So if I had a transient response that happened early on, say here, I wouldn't respond until I sampled again here. So that's why the capacitor has to be so big. But what the 24650 does is it monitors the output, okay, during this dead time, Okay, so let me see. Let's make that T dead. Okay, during this dead time. Okay, and if it should drop less than 3% of the regulated output, that's what this guy is, it should give a couple of little pulses. And those pulses are seen on the primary. It says, hey, speed up. So we'll immediately go to F max. It will sample the output and then it will adjust the duty cycle to control the output voltage. So it makes for a much faster transient response. So how does a faster transient re response with wake up help you? This is where I was talking about the output capacitor size. So this is C out the, no the way you'd normally design it, okay? You would have to design it okay, based on a transient response, okay, and a little buffer, okay, so in this case, they, they added, let me see, yeah, they, they added a little bit of buffer, okay, because it takes 
milliseconds to respond. Well, with the faster transient response, okay, you can go with a much smaller capacitor. That's actually one, it actually ends up being one seventh of the size. And to show how this works is simple math. This is how you'd size the capacitor, okay, for PSR with no wake up, okay? And this is how you'd size it for wake up. And if you go through the simple math, you'll see that the capacitor used with the fast wake up and PSR control is roughly one seventh of, a, of what it would have been without using it. So you'll have a much smaller capacitor and you can design for higher power densities. And this is what I just mentioned. This is just proof of concept. CL1 is no wake up. CL2 is wake up. And just remember that the total capacitance for PSR control with the UCC24650 and the UCC28730 is roughly one seventh of what it would have been if you didn't use that chipset. So like a lot of engineers, just explaining how this works is not good enough. They need to see how this works. So I evaluated this five volt, 10 watt design. You probably see these all over the place. It's an adapter cell phone charger. Use it for charging your cell phone or your iPad or whatever you happen to be using, okay? And I tested this device, okay, unmodified. And at the max frequency, it operated at 80 kilohertz. And at the min frequency, it operated at 125 kilohertz. I hit it with a zero to two amp transient, okay? And I saw a three volt transient response to the output, okay? So you don't like that. And to overcome that, you actually have to increase your output capacitor bank if you don't want as much droop. Because it's taking all this time, remember when I talked about the dead time here? I call this T dead. During this time, there's no sampling going on, okay? So I hit it with a transient response, okay, and nothing happened. And then by the time the chip woke up and sampled that the output voltage was low, then it did something. So then I added the wake up chip to this circuit, okay? And I did the same test with the same transient response. And my output, output droop with, with the same capacitance only dropped 400 millivolts. So here to lower the, the droop during the transient response, you'd have to increase C out, right? But here, if you have a faster wake up, you don't. So in your design, you can see intuitively that the design using the fast wake up with PSR control will reduce your capacitor bank. So let's talk about the UCC 24650 feature set. It's only rated for 200 volts max. Okay, that's one of its limitations. The applications that it was designed for is definitely people are trying to achieve zero power. I know this really beats the industry standards, but power supply manufacturers are trying to design for sub five milliwatts. And this is the way you go about it. You eliminate your opto, you have reduced switching frequencies, okay, to reduce your switching losses, all that will improve your overall average efficiency and also your standby power. You'll see this used a lot in smartphones, tablets, adapters, and set-top boxes. TV monitor, power supplies, home appliances, okay? I've even seen this used in coffee makers, okay? Industrial power supplies, used in lighting, home automation. Any place where you're designing less than 65 watts in a flyback, you could probably use this chipset, okay? Without, without a opto-isolator feedback and pretty, uh, pretty good standby power, okay? The feature set of the device, we talked about this already, it enables fast transient response that results in a smaller output capacitor. That's huge, okay? No external components required, no opto feedback, 
Okay, this is this is a huge bonus. It does require you using the UCC 28630 because all the chips on the market don't talk back and forth like this. Most of them use opto isolators. Here we use the transformer to make a more reliable design. So let's talk about the UCC 28730 a bit, the feature set, and we're gonna get into much more depth on how this IC works. I started out by telling you, hey, why should I use this? Okay, and I'm gonna finish off by telling you what the device actually does. So if you're interested, hang around. If you're not, you know, we'll, we'll figure something else out. Okay, so the UCC 28730 zero power standby primary side regulated flyback controller with constant voltage, constant current control, and this is mostly used in batteries, but don't limit it to batteries. You can use this thing anywhere where you need less than 65 watts. It's meant to work with the wake-up chip, the UCC24650, which we discussed earlier. Remember, this enables zero standby power. You can operate down to as a little frequency of 32 hertz. Without zero standby power, the lowest you can go is one kilohertz. So that cuts your switching losses down dramatically by a factor of almost 200 okay, when you're in standby mode, okay? It comes with the smart wake-up detection. Remember I talked about that? The output drops 3%, UCC 24650 sends pulses across the transformer. The 28730 realizes that it, its output voltage is low. It needs a faster frequency and a higher duty cycle and it immediately commands this, okay? And it will respond from the transient response faster. Remember one seventh the output capacitance. I know it's one over one, over 6.5, but that's roughly one seven, okay? You can regulate the output plus or minus 5% with this device without an opto isolator. We also have this high voltage startup inside the circuit, so you don't need this trickle charge resistor off the line. It makes the output, the uh, BDD capacitor smaller, okay? And it's a bonus. It's only rated for 700 volts, or I should say it's rated for a maximum of 700 volts. It has a maximum switching frequency of 83 kilohertz. And one of the things I'll talk about later as we go on in the presentation, one of the things that makes this more efficient is valley switching, okay? Most flybacks, the typical ones that are designed are hard switched, okay? You turn it on the switch of the reflected output voltage plus the input voltage plus the clamp voltage, and it's very high. It, it's usually, you know, 150% higher than the input, maybe even 175% of the input. Well, this technique lets you use some resonant ringing between the primary magnetizing inductance and the switch node. And we wait until the valley and turn on the switch. So your switching losses are drastically reduced. And that's one of the reasons why you have the, you know, the efficiency improvement and the standby power improvement. This device also has frequency dithering, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It actually will make it easier for you to meet your EMI specifications with the agency. Once again, the applications, they're all listed here, but I think this device plays nice in the power range of 65 watts or less. You can design flyback converters up to 250 watts if you're so challenged, but for that, I would recommend you use the UCC 28782 active clamp flyback because that gives you zero voltage switching and there's a lot of benefits about doing that, which I'm not gonna discuss during today's presentation, but if you have interest in that, Visit the Texas Instruments website and just do a search on the UCC 28782. We have reference designs and all kinds of things there that you can use to help you in the process. So the UCC 28730, oh yeah, we come with a bunch of protection features here. Okay, we have over voltage output protection without an opto, uh, without an opto present. Basically, we sense the output voltage through the secondary to aux turns ratio. If we see 4.62 volts during the energy delivery period on the VS pin, we shut down. We know it's an OVP condition. That generally regu regulates at 4.0 volts. Okay, we also have overcurrent protection. You generally design for 750 millivolt current sense. Okay, in this case, 740 millivolts. At 1.5, roughly 200%, you shut down the converter for an over, overcurrent condition. We'll discuss how that works. It also has another feature. It has input under voltage protection. Guess what? Once again, it's sensed off the aux winding and primary turns ratio. 
So you don't need an opto to tell you what's going on in the primary and the input. You can do it all through the transform returns ratio. I'm actually surprised people didn't figure this out years ago. The device does have thermal shutdown around 165 degrees C. If you haven't paid attention to your thermals, the IC will shut down and enter a fault mode. So let's talk a little bit about how this IC starts up. Okay, remember how I said that it uses it uses FM, AM, FM modulation. Well, when the device starts up, there's no voltage there, okay? So the device will start up. The VDD capacitor, CDD will charge and follow this curve, okay? And when it reaches the UVLO turn on of the device, it will give three switching pulses at the maximum switching frequency. And it will control the peak current to one third the value. And you're like, why am I doing this? Well, you're sampling the output and you're sampling the input and you're doing all kinds of things here. You're looking for faults, okay? When I start up, is my input voltage high enough? If it's not, don't start. That's what's going on here. I charged up, I started switching, the converter saw nothing, okay? So it says stop switching and the IDD current on the VDD pin will discharge this, okay? Until it reaches the UVLO turn off, and then it will start the process all over again and recharge. And it will give three pulses again once this threshold is met. And if it is met, switching will start, switching will continue, will start regulating. So you won't start up into a fault. If you have someone that has a short on the output of this, it's not going to start up. And that's what you want. Okay, well, if you're charging a battery and you have a faulty battery, you don't want your 10, your 5 volt, 10 watt supply delivering two amps forever, okay? Your cables are gonna get hot, okay? You could even melt your connector. So this is a protection feature. So we have some waveforms of the startup, okay? With a low input voltage. I turn on the voltage, okay? I, I have basically my gate drive, okay? I have my, my, v, my VDD voltage, okay? And I have my current sense. So I started up at a low voltage. I start up, I get these three current sense pulses. I sense the primary through my primary to aux turns ratio. I don't have enough input. It says, forget it, shut down. And it does. So then I start up the converter and now an input voltage range where it should work. I start it up, okay. Once again, this is my drive, okay. This basically is my aux winding. And this is my current sense. I give three initial pulses. I see that I'm not in an OVP condition. I see I'm not an input under voltage. I say start switching and control the output, and that's what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm so I'm up and regulating now. That's just an example of how the fault works. Some people actually troubleshoot these circuits and they start them up and they say nothing's happening. I I, I apply 50 volts to my supply and I hear nothing, I see nothing. And I'm like, well, what's your minimum input voltage designed for? You're at 50 volts, soft line design. Shouldn't it be around 60? Yeah, that's where I said it. I said it's 60. Well, what's happening is your design thinks it's an input under voltage fault because it is, because you don't have enough input voltage to actually regulate the output. So the device is working exactly the way it should be. So now we're going to get in a little bit of how this device really works and, it, and, it, and what makes us achieve this standby power. And it, we actually have an improved overall average efficiency, which is from 25 to 100% load, is this feature that's called control law. Okay, and what it does is as the load goes down, okay, the frequency goes down. And that's what this curve represents, okay? So at max load, we're operating at the max frequency, max duty cycle. As the load decreases, we'll decrease the frequency, okay? There is a section where we actually decrease the peak current, and that's actually to reduce audible noise, but we'll talk about that later, okay? But mainly in this section, we're talking about how we're using the frequency and decreasing the frequency to improve lighter load efficiency. In other words, you're backing off the switching frequency, so your switching losses are being reduced. Normally, in normal designs that use primary side regulated control, 
the minimum switching frequency is one kilohertz, okay? And you can't achieve a standby power of five milliwatts, okay, with one kilohertz, but you can with 32 hertz. So let's dive in a little deeper about how this guy works, okay? Because you don't get primary side regulation for free, all right? You've eliminated the opto-isolator. You've made your device more, your design more robust, okay? You reduce costs on cost of the design by removing those components. So how do I do that? I talked about this a little bit earlier. Turn on the switch. I control to a primary peak current. I shut off the switch. Okay, here I am at the aux winding. The aux winding voltage was negative when the switch was on. Okay, because the polarities are reversed across the transformer. I turn off the switch, it flies high. I'll see this little leakage spike here. We're calling it TLK reset. That's the leakage spike seen at the switch node, which will also be seen at the aux winding. So basically during time TB, all right, when this switch is let go, we're blanking out. We don't want you to look at that leakage spike. We don't want you to control to that, okay? We've controlled the current sense at max load to 740 millivolts, okay? We have a leading edge blanking of 225 microseconds. So you don't react, you don't want to control to this leading edge leaking spike that you see on the aux signal. All right, and at light loads, it's 750 nanoseconds and not 2.25 microseconds. And at the end of delivering energy here, and you'll see this throughout the presentation known as a sample point. That's where we make decisions based on frequency and peak current. And then we, we basically monitor the, the aux winding, okay? We've done the sample. We monitor the, through the VS pin. We look for a zero current detection, and we add a little bit of a delay before we turn on the switch. This is kind of known is what's known as valley switching. And if you can't see it right away, remember the aux winding is coupled to the secondary and it's coupled to the primary. So this is a representation of the switch node. And you can think of this as being zero volts. So on the last slide, I went in detail about this, okay? This slide just covers everything that I discussed earlier. You turn on the switch, you deliver energy, you sample the output through the transformer turns ratio. You look for the zero, in other words, when the transformer is not delivering any more current. You look for a zero current detection at the VS pin. You add a delay, you turn on the switch. You're getting a resonant tank between the magnetizing inductance and the switch node capacitance. And you can think of that almost as COSS and the reflected output capacitance across the transform. And even your PCB adds capacitance. One of the things I'd like to point out when you're doing this design, if you choose to do primary side regulation, is make sure your design's clean. Don't hand wind your transformer and expect this thing to work. Because there's a lot of interwinding capacitance, you create more leakage inductance than you need, and you get tons of ripple and you won't get proper sampling. So you wanna make sure you have less than 150 millivolts peak to peak at the sample point. This is a design tip. So let's dig deeper into the control law. Remember how I said this used FM AM modulation scheme to control the duty cycle, which is basically T on over T on plus the blanking period plus the sample period, which is TS. Okay, and then you can have an extended delay because this drives deep into DCM. You start off in critical conduction and it's a constant on time. So as the frequency, as the Duty cycle, less duty cycle is needed with the same peak current, you're gonna back off the frequency. 
So this is how the converter works. So you design for the max frequency, in this case of 83 kilohertz, okay, and you're at the max load. And internally, there's a voltage amplifier and it's set at five volts and it's demanding max frequency and max duty cycle, which in this case is about 57% because it's a flyback. You can't get 100% to fly back because that'd be a short. So you're at full load, you decrease the load, you increase the input voltage, and you need less duty cycle. So what do I do? I decrease the frequency. The voltage amplifier will go from 5 to 3.55 volts, and basically it will keep extending this EP delay and the dead time. So you go deeper into DCM. So if I needed to go deeper into DCM at a lower frequency, my ring would look like this. And it still maintains valley switching. So not only am I DCM, but I'm valley switched. So we have this AM feature. I've talked about, I've talked about this AM FM modulation scheme. Why do I need AM? Why would I possibly need AM? Well, it has to do with sound. So if I did this design at 83 kilohertz and I selected my magnetizing inductance and I'm decreasing the frequency, okay? No problems until I get around 20 kilohertz, then I can hear it, okay? So what I'm trying to do here in the AM range is basically control the peak current from its maximum, okay? This is like 740 millivolts, I believe, down to 240 millivolts on the current sense. Okay, I I don't want it to be audible. So it gets to be around 28 kilohertz. It's eight kilohertz above the audible frequency. So, so there's less energy to produce a speaker. And think about this, you're transforming your PCB from a natural speaker. So taking energy out of the inductor by decreasing the current will help reduce audible noise. And that's what this does. So as you need less and less duty cycle, when you start operating at 28 kilohertz, You'll decrease the peak current. You'll decrease it from its maximum to one third its maximum to control the duty cycle. And then as you need less and less load, you'll start operating on this side of the current and you won't decrease the peak current anymore. This is basically done to reduce audible noise. It's all about energy in the inductor. Everyone remembers this equation, E is equal to one half Li squared. Less energy means less audible noise. So we talked about the converter. We're at lighter loads or we're increasing the voltage. We need less and less duty cycle. We've already controlled in the upper FM band, the lower FM band, the voltage amplifier is heading in this direction, okay? And, and now we need less duty cycle but we have a third of the peak current. The, still the same thing holds true. We control it to one third of the peak current. Like at max load, we control it to here. As the load goes down, we control it to here at one third. This part of the circuit remains the same. As we need less and less duty cycle, we increase the delays and increase the ringing and turn on at a valley. Pardon me, because I'm writing with my mouse if it's not too legible. And as the, de the duty cycle needs to decrease even less, we removed all our output power. We have none, okay? So what do we do now? We back down to 32 hertz, okay? In other words, there's nothing left in the tank. That's the lowest we can go, all right? You do need a little preload. Uh, to make this no, no preload, you'd have to go down to zero hertz and essentially your output capacitor bank would get huge so that's why we don't go down to zero hertz earlier i talked about frequency dither this device actually dithers the frequency okay roughly plus or minus eight percent and it's like a, it's a spread spectrum a spread spectrum frequency reduction on the EMI signature. And it will really reduce average EMI. In reality, it's helping you pass the EMI requirements based on how 
your frequency modulation or your frequency measurement equipment is set up for EMI. It works, it will give you like a two to five dB reduction. It's a common industry, you know, way of reducing EMI. There's many papers written on how to do this. We incorporated this into the chip so you don't have to do it externally. This actually shows the two to five dB reduction when you're using dithering and non-dithering. Obviously the higher curves are without dither and this is with dither on the same design. I think the systems engineer that put this together actually disabled dithering to take these curves. I have to say one thing though, frequency dithering doesn't come for free. You'll actually, remember how I said you use the frequency to control the duty cycle? Well, if I'm dithering the frequency, I'm dithering the duty cycle. That's gonna make small changes on the output and it's gonna show up as ripple. And if you look at any of our evaluation modules using PSR control, you'll see this ripple here. But it's, it's you know, it's less than 100 millivolts. It's, it's generally nothing to worry about. It meets all USB specification. But if you design power supplies, a lot of times you'll say, hey, there's something wrong with my feedback loop. I don't have enough phase margin. And that's why I got this ringing and I'll have to go in there and compensate the loop. Well, the good news is this part doesn't come with any loop compensation. You don't need it. You size the output capacitor for loop compensation, but that's much smaller than what you would have needed for transient response anyway. We do have this feature in the device that adds an offset, okay? And it's based on this RLC resistor and this KLC, I think that's 48, okay? But what this does is, as your input voltage goes up, there's a delay in the part. There's a delay in all parts. It's like 50 nanoseconds, I think. It might even be higher. It might be as high as 100 nanoseconds. Okay, but at higher voltages, you'll hit that peak current faster. And the switch takes 50 nanoseconds to turn off. That delay gives you more current and that, that current gets transferred to the output. We actually don't want that. You want to control. Remember how I said this is constant current control? You want to deliver one amp to the output, whether the output's at regulation or it's 75% within regulation. So you don't want that to change, especially if you use it in a battery charger. Remember I said it's not limited to battery chargers, but constant current is used for battery chargers. And to make sure that peak energy is controlled, in other words, the primary peak current is controlled within plus or minus 5%, just like the output. Actually, it might even be plus or minus 8%. It's so the output power doesn't get too much energy because of overshoot. So this is kind of like a, a voltage feed forward on the peak current. So we added that feature to the device so you turn off the switch when you have to. So at low line, you turn off the switch where you normally would at peak. Okay, this is low line. And at high line, at your higher input voltages, you wanna turn it off earlier. And that's what this is doing. So let's talk about some design tips and recommendations. And I always like including this. If you've never designed a power supply before, we have many things on the power supply design seminar series that tell you how to design the design a power supply. We have WebEx design tools. We have all these features on the TI website that can help you do the design. And that would take more than the 50 minutes that I have to present to you. But when I do one of these designs, I kind of take notes and I want to share information with customers and other people doing the design so they don't run into the same headaches that I've run into. Okay, one of the things about this device is some people over filter the VS pin. And this is generally because you did a poor layout. They'll over filter the VS pin and says, oh, it doesn't start up. And the reason why it doesn't start up is when you're starting the device up and you're looking for the input voltage, this device is actually looking for a current coming out of the VS pin. And if it doesn't see it, it won't start. Well, if I put a capacitor here, it won't see it. So don't do this. And if you do do this, make sure it's less than 3.3 picofarads. You know, 
When I put this slide together, I said there was no need for a current sense cap. There isn't. I mean, the device has 225 nanoseconds of leading edge blanking. And if everyone remembers what this guy looks like in reality, you have this big spike here. Okay, and this, this is the current sense signal. Okay, we have this big spike. We all know that it's the capacitor that's between the gate and source. Okay, it's there, it's known. And we blank this out. So you don't pay attention to this. Okay, it's current sense leading edge blanket, it's 200, 225 nanoseconds. However, to be smart, I would put a placeholder for a cap here just in case you need it. You probably won't, but if you did a poor layout, you're gonna want to include this. My other design tip, I was talking about the aux winding. So here's my aux winding. Okay, I got my leading edge spike, and then I got ringing, and I got some ringing, and I turned the switch on, right? This is V aux. We also know that this is V secondary as well. Okay, so they're all coupled. And if I have excessive ringing here, I can't control. So how do I deal with that? Just add your add a little RC snubber here. Put a placeholder there. The other thing that I can recommend is use an RCD clamp. It's not drawn here, but there should be a resistor here too. This is like 22 ohms. This is like 511K. It will help snubber the switch node. It will help dampen this ringing and add a snubber. Remember, removing the opto isolator doesn't come for free. You're depending on the signal that's presented at the aux to control this device. You're saving money on your design by removing the opto isolator, but it doesn't come for free and this aux signal needs to be clean. However, with the tips in this presentation, you can do that. You can, you can make your design, you can reduce the noise, be smart about winding your transformer. Machine wound is preferred because once you have your design working, you want your results repeated. If you hand wind your transformers, you can't repeat your results, you just can't. If you're the only person winding the transformer, you might be able to, especially if you get the engineer who designed the transformer. But I don't know about you, I don't design more than three. These are the simplified transformer calculations, you know, on, on how you size the transformer. Okay, this is just simple, you know, both second balance if you want to go through and calculate these. How do I size the magnetizing inductance based on energy and peak current? That's all this is. Okay, it's a straightforward calculation. If you put it in the math cat, it works. When you design your transformer, okay, design for the maximum switching frequency, not the men. One of the things that you have to pay attention to when designing your transformer and pulling it, taking your transformer turns ratio is remember what your maximum demagnetization time is. They term it demag. This demag time is actually the time you're delivering energy to the secondary. I'm still here. I'm just cleaning up my drawing. That's this time. You need to know that to calculate out the Dmax. Once you have the Dmax based on both second balance, you can select the transformer turns ratio. If you do not do this and you try to use any off the shelf transformer, I guarantee it will not work for your design. You have to size the primary magnetizing inductance based on the energy you need for the design, the maximum switching frequency, the power. And if you don't follow that, the design is just not going to work. One of the things I talked about earlier, this fine tuning, you've got your design, you've got it working, 
If you're designing for battery application and you want this nice curve, this is the constant current, constant voltage curve. This is constant current. This is constant voltage. Once you have your design up and running, use your RLC resistor and your RCS resistor to fine tune exactly where you want this point to be. In other words, you have your design working, you have everything working, you did it all based on your theoretic, theoretical turns ratios. You even set your output divider based on this information. Just go in and hand tweak it to get exactly what you want. Because your theoretical doesn't match your design always. Your magnetizing inductance might be 10% high. Your output rectifier may have 250 more millivolts or 250 millivolts less on it than you want. So you gotta make adjustments for that. And you have the tools, RLC, RCS, RS1 and RS2. We talked about this earlier, the feature set of the 28730. Remember, it uses the AM-FM modulation scheme. It will go down to 32 hertz. It will have less than five milliwatts of standby power. You can actually get a little bit of X-cap discharge off of this. You may need external circuitry depending on what kind of design requirements you're gonna need. Remember the applications where you can use this. I recommend in less than 65 watt applications. This device has been used. It meets Energy Star, European Code of Conduct, Tier 2, and the Department of Energy Level 6 of energy standards. That is for standby power and average efficiency from 25, 50, 75, and 100% load. Once again, we're reviewing the 24650. It has low QS and current, but the big thing about this device is you need one seventh the capacitance. So by adding this device, you decrease C. In summary, what does a UCC 28730 and UCC 24650 chipset bring me? One, it eliminates the need for an opto-isolator and all the circuitry involved. By using this circuitry, it allows for a much faster transient response. It also allows me to reduce that output capacitor by a factor of roughly seven, and I'll be honest, roughly, which will allow me to design for higher power density and save money in my design. It's the industry's first controller out in the market that was designed to enable zero standby power, less than five milliwatts. And everybody leaves their adapters plugged in all the time. You got one for your cell phone. You got one for your Fitbit. They're all over the place. They're all in, they're all dissipating energy. No one ever unplugs them. Hey, let's save the world a little you know, energy and resources. Dissipating less than five milliwatts is a good thing. I hope the design tips in the, that I've given you during this process help simplify your design process if you choose to design for PSR control. Thank you for your time and uh, are there any questions? Yeah, Mike, one of the questions that just came across was design for max frequency, not the min. Isn't it the opposite? Can you clarify? No, yeah, you have to design it for max frequency and not min. It's the control law. The control law actually ends up operating differently than you would think. If this was a if this was a quasi-resonant flyback converter, you'd be operating at the minimum frequency peak peak power low line. But this is a DCM flyback controller. So we're breaking the law here. We're essentially, we're DCM, we're not quasi-resonant. So what we're doing to control the duty cycle, okay, we're sizing the, the inductor, okay, at the max frequency. So it's to deliver energy when the max power is being delivered. If you do, do it at low line, you will never operate at the max frequency. You'll never operate at a three kilohertz. Say at low line, okay, you design for your max duty cycle and you select your, your transformer down here. Where it, well, when you're at high line and you need less duty cycle, you're gonna go this way. So you're gonna reduce your dynamic range in the converter. This is DCM, it's not quasi-resonant. What he's saying is true about quasi-resonant, you design for the minimum frequency, but not for DCM and FM modulation. Because we're using the frequency actually to control the duty cycle. Lower frequency means less duty cycle.
Okay, and there was another question that came in earlier about um, what is a maximum or peak voltage the wake up IC can accept from a flyback winding? I answered with the range, but did you want to go into that more? Yeah, that that's 200 volts. That's that's based on the reflected voltage plus the output voltage it needs to be less than 200 volts. So that depends on your transformer turns ratio. It's not just the input; it's your output voltage and the transformer turns ratio. Your 200 volts is your limit, and how you size within that limit has to do with your input voltage and the transformer turns ratio. I don't know exactly what voltage they're talking about. But I have seen this design device used up to at least 375, actually 400 volts peak without too much issue. In some cases, I've seen it as high as 600 volts input without issue. Okay, and we have another question here. An application sensitive to common mode pollution from primary secondary capacitance. Is there an interest to use valley switching other active clamp? The active clamp, the active clamp, okay, if you use an active clamp flyback or forward converter, okay, the older parts that had active clamp, if you set up the timing, you get valley switching, okay? The UCC 28780 has zero voltage switching for active clamp flybacks. I recommended that above 65 watts. So there you have true zero voltage switching. Here you only have valley switching, but that is, that is a much more efficient place than turning on the switch here. Remember, this is a representation of the switch node. We turn on at the valleys. So this isn't as good as, okay, zero voltage switching. And the other thing that an active clamp flyback does for you that this presentation doesn't even talk about, you're recovering the energy, okay, from the clamp capacitor, from your RCD clamp, and recycling it into the system rather than dis just dissipating power. An active clamp flyback is more efficient than a DCM flyback. This is a DCM flyback. So an ACF with zero voltage switching will be more efficient than this. But less than 65 watts, people don't usually want to pay extra money for an extra switch on the high side to form an active clamp. Okay, hey, let's join. Yeah, yes, we have one more. We have, um, can you really achieve less than five milliwatts standby power with the snubbers, RCD, clamp, and preload? How do you measure less than five milliwatts can, to verify? If you, go to the, if you go to the Texas Instruments website, there's a 28730 EVM that's on the website, and it shows a standby power at 230 volts less than five milliwatts. Absolutely. They can order the EVM even if they want to. Quiet, was okay, that the last that looks like one? All, that looks like all the questions we have for now. All right, that sounds good. So, I mean, this is this this part is very interesting, I think. I, I, I think primary side regulated flyback control is one of the nicest, compli, uh, nicest control schemes that TI has come up with to meet these new high energy efficiency standards as well as low standby power. So I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation and thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thank everyone for joining us. All session recordings and presentations will be available to view later this week on pi.com slash high voltage seminar. That's all one word. You will also receive an email with links to the on demand presentation and a post event survey. We would like your feedback so you can continue to improve our content for future seminars. And thank you all again and have a great rest of your day.